north after a fine frosty start in the south. Friday evening on BBC One and at seven, problems in El Dorado. Look, I'm finished, right? But how, how, how are we gonna afford this? We can't manage like this, can we? So we're stuffed. They stuffed us, okay? At 7.30, trouble with a dog for Dr. Latimer. Morning, Helen. Woodhouse has left her calling card on my patio. <laughs> Sir, she's doing unspeakable things to the tortoise. <laughs> Challenge Annika at 8. Right, everyone, we've got 15 minutes to go, um, in which time we've got to make this place look like a really organised, clean, clear nursery. Go for it. <laughs> Drama at 9.30, between the lines. Oh, sir, um... How many police cameras were in operation on the night of the riot? Would you get out of my office, please? Friday evening on BBC One. Bad-tempered old grouch Victor Meldrew is in an optimistic mood for a change in 45 minutes. First on BBC One, Sue Cook and Nick Ross appeal for your help in this month's Crime Watch UK. <laughs> Good evening. We had more calls on Crime Watch last month than ever before. 2,180 viewers rang with information and with some tantalising outcomes. More than a third of those calls were on one case, the stabbing of Rachel Nickell on Wimbledon Common. You may have read about a flurry of activity on the murder and then it all seemed to go quiet. In fact, police say they've made remarkable progress, entirely as a result of viewers' information and Wimbledon police have asked us to pass their thanks to all 812 people who phoned. Some were divulging fears about a close friend or someone in their family. The team now has a major new line of inquiry, and they say on balance of probabilities, it will lead them to the killer. Twelve more people have come forward who were on the common at the time, and one viewer recognised the Crime Watch video fit as a man walking a dog who was near the murder scene an hour before the attack. Another viewer actually saw a similar man with a knife and thinks at one stage he was stabbing a tree. Police want us to ask just once again, if you were anywhere near Wimbledon Common on the morning of Wednesday the 15th of July, did you see a man in his late 20s, about 5 foot 10, in dark trousers and a white shirt? Here's the number, please do take a note of it, 081 811 8181. Almost 500 viewers called with clues on the kidnapping in Cheshire. Mrs. Kerr? Yes? Does your husband drive a silver grey Volvo estate? Age registration? Yes, he does. Well, I'm afraid I've got some bad news for you. Despite the ordeal the bank manager's wife had been through, she was able to compile a good description of her assailant. Six names were suggested by Crime Watch viewers, and one name came up several times. A number of details seem to fit, but police say there's nothing to link that particular man to the crime. He's now been eliminated from the inquiry. So, another look at the artist's impression. Do you know who this is? There's been progress on both our other reconstructions, though no arrests to date. On the Katie Ratcliffe murder in Hampshire, 18 more people have been traced who were at the nightclub where she'd been the night she died. And detectives have a mountain of suggestions to work through on two people and a vehicle they need to find. And on the armed robbery in Chesterfield, police have 30 new leads to work through. And a potential witness came forward when he recognised a vehicle, shown in the reconstruction as his. But no arrests so far. Well, our first case tonight is one that made headline news in August. Guests at a wedding party in Horndean in Hampshire discovered the body of 15-year-old schoolgirl Helen Gorry in the grounds of Merchiston Hall Community Centre, only minutes from where she lived. There are several witnesses in the area who remember seeing girls who looked like Helen shortly before her death. So the task now, with your help hopefully, is to establish exactly what did happen that night. Helen was a sociable girl with lots of friends. She loved being out and about. 
but more than anything else, she loved spending her time with children and wanted to be a nanny when she left school. Helen lived on an estate nearby with her stepbrother and her mother, Sheila. She was a typical teenager, typical 15-year-old. She loved her music, loved dancing, adored babies, and babies adored her. Very bubbly. She had a great sense of humour and personality that everybody loved. I don't think she had an enemy in the world. <laughs> On the night Helen died, she'd spent the later part of the evening at home with her brother Jamie. What are you making? Cheese sandwich. Make me one. Take your own. Fine. Want some cornflakes? No thanks. Ten minutes walk away from the house is the local community centre, Murchiston Hall, where on a Friday night there are all kinds of social activities. Eyes on one another, didn't you, dear? And perhaps I should have mentioned hands off. Horndean Amateur Theatrical Society were rehearsing a play there that evening. It's now about half past eleven. I borrowed a video. Do you want to watch it? No, I'll watch it later. I'm going to go up now. But a few minutes later, she was back downstairs again. Oh, I won't be long. Where are you going? I won't be long. It wasn't unusual for Helen to go out this late. A lot of her friends lived nearby. Sometimes they called for her. Or she might have seen someone she knew from an upstairs window and gone out to meet them. This is the old A3, or Portsmouth Road, at the junction with Catherington Lane. The main road runs past Murchiston Hall. At about 10 to midnight, 20 minutes after Helen left home, a local man saw a girl fitting Helen's description standing in a bus shelter on the Portsmouth Road. At the same time, a car, possibly an escort, came up from Catherington Lane. A passing motorist, Patricia Longyear, also saw the girl getting into the car. But then further along the road, she saw someone else who looked like Helen with two men. The two men were of opposite appearance. The larger one of the two seemed to be overweight, casually dressed, red hair shining in the light. The other was slighter built, very smart. Clearly one of those girls wasn't Helen. So if one of them was you, please call. Come on, James. Yeah. Thanks. By this time, Murchiston Hall had closed, but there were still groups of people in the grounds. At around midnight, Sheila Good was driving past the hall along the Portsmouth Road. As I was driving along, a man came out of the bushes. I got the impression that um, he didn't want me to see his face. Some half an hour later, Roger Woods was driving along the same stretch of road. He remembers two men standing several yards apart, but he had the impression they were together. One man in particular caught his attention. What made him stand out is uh, the way he was looking at me, as much to say, oh God, somebody's spotted us. Police believe it may have been around this time that Helen was killed. Her body was discovered the following day. She'd been asphyxiated. So appeals on several sightings there, and several sightings of girls looking like Helen that night, which is a problem for you, really. It is, and clearly all the sightings cannot be Helen. So we would ask, if you are one of those girls, please come forward and help us to eliminate you. If uh, the girl with the ginger-haired man is Helen, of course, then he is of particular significance to this inquiry. And if not, of course, we need to eliminate them from the inquiry. Yes, sir. Now, there's somebody else you need to hear from. On the Monday after Helen's death, a shop assistant at the one-stop supermarket in Catherington Lane remembers one particular customer. I saw her on the Friday night. She passed me on the street on the corner. It was about half past 12. And I thought, you silly girl, you're only about 15. What are you doing out so late? Have you been to the police? Oh, oh no. You ought to. Well, yeah, I might. Anything helps? <laughs> as soon as I mentioned the police, it was a bit shaky. All you really want to do is just get away from me. Now, that man's important to you. Why? 
Yeah, he's vital to us. We don't have a, a positive sighting of Helen after 11.30 on that Friday night. We don't know where she went, who she met, or what she did. So anybody who can give us a positive sighting of Helen after 11.30 uh, would be of great interest. And that man in particular seems to have, uh, we thinks he saw her, he needs to come forward to us. Mm. He seemed a bit nervous about contacting the police. You, you can offer him complete discretion. Yes, we can. He can contact us in confidence. And he, he need have no fear about contacting us. Now, Murchison Hall was very busy that night, as we said. Have you talked to everybody who was there that night? It's Friday the 31st of July. We've spoken to a, a large number of people who were there, but we know that there were teenagers in the grounds of that hall up until midnight. They have not come forward. It's essential that they do. And again, I'm not concerned why they were in the grounds of the hall, I'm concerned only with Helen's death, and we need information from them. So please come forward if you were in the grounds of Murchison Hall on that Friday night could be vital. A witness has also told you that a blue Ford Fiesta was seen parked in the area. Yes, at about midnight a metallic blue Ford Fiesta was actually in the grounds of Murchiston Hall and may have been associated with two teenage lads who were there. No real description except they were probably wearing blue jeans. But again, that car could be quite crucial. If you know who the, who the owner of that car is, or if you are the owner of that car, please come forward. Right, well, if you were in Horndean that night, if you saw any of those things, it was late Friday the 31st of, 31st of July and right into the small hours of Saturday the 1st of August. If you think you can help at all, you can ring us here on 081 811 8181 or you can call the Havant Police Station, that's on 0705 321111. That's 0705, the code for Havant, 321111. I should tell you the uh, lines coming to the studio are busy already. <coughs> Things happened so fast on Crime Watch last month with so many calls, we scarcely had a chance to sort them out in time for Crime Watch update. Photocall alone took 114 calls and resulted in two arrests. One man has been charged with fraud and another has been charged with murder. Maybe you'll know someone tonight. Here are Detective Constable Jackie Hames and Superintendent David Hatcher with faces you might recognise in this month's photocall. West Midlands Police need your help to identify these two men. On the 5th of March, they went into a jeweller's in Briarley Hill on the pretense of buying a Rolex watch. The shop assistant described this man as very plausible. He even gave details for a credit agreement, which later turned out to be false. After trying on one of the watches, he ran out of the shop still wearing it. He was joined by the second man and they escaped in this Ford Sierra, which had been stolen the day before in Solihull. The watch, a gent's 18 karat gold Oyster Rolex, has a black face and is similar to this one. It's valued at £12,500 and the clasp bears a unique serial number, 200698, only visible if the strap is removed. This man's about 25, six foot with short straight black hair. He may have shaved off his beard and moustache. More distinctively though, he had a tattoo on his left thumb, possibly the name Mary. The second man in his early 20s is five foot nine with short straight brown hair shaved at the back. If you can help at all, please call. Next, Thames Valley Police would like to speak to this man in connection with a building society fraud. At the Abbey National in Reading, on the 26th of August, a stolen building society passbook and forged driving licence were used to obtain cash. Three hours later in Lincoln, more cash was withdrawn, along with a cheque which was made payable to an N chapel. The man is in his early 30s, about 5 foot 9, with short dark hair and a moustache. If you can help, please call now. If you're a keen rugby supporter, you might have seen James Kenneth Cunningham. He's a New Zealander, but is believed to be here in the UK. New Zealand police are investigating a sexual assault which occurred in Gisborne over two years ago. James Kenneth Cunningham is 32, 5 foot 11 and was last seen in the London area. If you know where he is, phone now. Finally, do you recognise this man? Saying he had a gun, he robbed the Leak United Building Society in Marketplace, Utoxeter, on Friday the 17th of July. Police in Leicestershire would also like to speak to him in connection with a number of similar offences. He's 30 to 40, about 5 foot 10, with dark, greasy hair. If you know who he is or can help with any of our other photocall cases, please call us now. And the number to ring here in the studio is 081 811-8181. That's 081-811-8181. And there seemed to be an encouraging um, volume of calls coming through already. We've had information already, more calls coming in on the description we gave 
of the man police would like to question on in connection with the murder of Rachel Nickel. Uh, we've had several promising calls on the video we, fit, we showed again of the man involved in the Cheshire kidnap and there's been uh, one name in particular for the red-haired man in the Helen Gorry case and uh, more calls are coming in that as I speak. So uh, we'll keep them monitored. Nick. Does the name Michael Towler mean anything to you? Michael Towler, that is, from Holly Street in Great Horton in Bradford. Michael was a part-time shop assistant and a charity worker until one Wednesday night in early August he was murdered. This appeal now is naturally focused on the Bradford area and it's aimed in part at men who've had gay contacts there. For there are two things that seem likely about Michael's killer. He might have been one of Michael's homosexual partners and he may well kill someone else. Our reconstruction begins in Shipley, in West Yorkshire. Good morning, Dial Bradford. I'll see, uh, I All wonder right. if we ought to do a couple of letters. Could you take one for me? Dial is the Disabled Information Action Line, and Michael helped here several times a month. Uh, I am writing on behalf of the group. I first met Michael about three years ago, and I mainly got to know him through the uh, fundraising committee. He was treasurer, I was secretary. I always found him a kind man, a straightforward man, and a very honest man. If anybody needed anything doing in the street where he lived, he would do it. Michael was always there. Holly Street's a little dead-end road with houses back to back, so you go through an alley, sometimes called a ginnel, to reach Michael Towler's door. It's the sort of place where everyone knows everyone. I've known Michael 20 years, and I've been here 22, and we made friends. We used to call in quite regularly for a cup of tea and the chat. Hello. If he didn't want a cup of tea, we'd have the chat. Oh, Margaret, how are Hello, you? Hello, Michael. I'm all right. He used to do jobs for me. But they were always willing. To help. What have you been up to while I've been away? Nothing. It's been very quiet. I knew Michael was a homosexual. And it never made any difference with any of us on the street. On Wednesday, the 5th of August, Julie Walsh, one of Michael's neighbours, was watching the Olympics with her boyfriend and her son. They were waiting for the finals of the women's hurdles. Billy, turn the telly down. Michael's having an argument with somebody. What's he saying? I don't know. Turn it down. Uh, this is a monster. I knew it was Michael's voice, but I don't actually know who was shouting at. I never saw anybody. I just thought it were kids in the garden messing about. This time they go. Hemmings very slowly away in lane number seven. Sally Gunnell's gone very quickly. Good, good. Michael's argument couldn't have lasted long because half an hour later he was chatting calmly to a friend but he was clearly finding this a trying evening. Yeah, right. Go on. Hey! This is private property. If you come back again, I'll call the police. Whoever he was angry with that evening is an important witness. Please call us now if it was you. Sorry about that. Now, uh, where were we? Two hours later, a couple from just down the street were going out. Hi, Michael. Hello. Michael looked as though he was waiting. Was he waiting for you? Mary Barber lives next door to Michael. I was in my bedroom and I heard a knock at the door when I looked out of the window. There was nobody stood on my doorstep, so I just presumed it was somebody knocking on Michael's door. That was 10 o'clock. Into Downstairs, an hour later, Mary's son, Scott, was settling down to a late supper. Could hear Michael's telly on next door, it was quite loud. First of all, it was just telly on, and then I started hearing noises. You could hear somebody talking, I couldn't hear what they were saying, it was mumble and I couldn't actually tell it whether it was Michael or not. And I just listened for a few seconds and then I thought, well, what else of it?
The Hare and Hounds pub is round the corner from Michael's house. At a quarter to midnight, this couple were heading home when someone caught their eye. Look at that guy up there, what's he doing? I saw this man with a white jumper on and he was just looking all about himself and he looked a bit strange and that. Was this the killer or could it have been you? When we turned round onto Beacon Road, he started running across Beacon Road up um, Back Street onto Holly Street. And then we came along Beacon Road and I looked back to see if I could see him come out of Holly Street. And I saw a white um, Sierra with a man bending down, putting some in care. Again, could this be you? Or was this the killer who'd stolen Michael's video? Next day, no one in Holly Street saw Michael. He missed two appointments and didn't answer calls. He was discovered with multiple stab wounds lying dead on his living room floor. This is the same sort of video that was stolen from Michael Towler's home. It's an old uh, Toshiba. Its model number is V55B, but you won't find that on the front anywhere. It's only written in a small thing on the back. It has no remote control. And incidentally, on Michael's video, there's probably no flap here. Have you bought one like this or seen one since uh, early August? Do you know who's acquired one since then, particularly in the Bradford area? If it's a different video, it'll be easy to eliminate. The police are only interested in finding Michael's killer, so please don't be embarrassed about calling however a video was acquired during that period since August. 081 And please don't be embarrassed about calling with information if you've had gay relationships and don't want them revealed, but think you nonetheless have information. Police here have promised to be utterly discreet. Jeremy Clark from Gallup Gay London Policing is taking calls and will help to reassure people that any sensitive information won't be divulged to anyone and won't be kept after the inquiry is over. There are 20 lines here to the studio or you can call direct to the team in Bradford on a free phone number 0800 45 4000. 0800 45 4000. Well, with appeals now on investigations all over the country, at the incident desk, as usual, are Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames. First tonight on Incident Desk, we need your help to identify this man. He's one of several robbers who forced their way into the home of 53-year-old John Glover on the 3rd of September. John had been enjoying a drink with friends at his local pub in West Kingsdown in Kent. He'd just arrived home at 9.30 when he was subjected to an appalling attack on his own doorstep. He was repeatedly hit over the head and lay helpless in the hallway while his house was ransacked. These are just some of the items which are stolen. A naval sword inscribed with the initials PFG, several extremely valuable paintings and silverware, some of which bore this family crest. Two cars similar to these were seen in the area at the time of the attack and may belong to the robbers. Perhaps you'll recognise one of them. He's between 45 and 50, 5 foot 8, stocky build, clean shaven with a dark complexion. He was wearing a tweedy type cap and jacket with a lime green shirt. Mr Glover was badly shaken up and is still recovering from his injuries. So if you have any information at all, please call us here tonight. This man may be one of a gang who turned the M4 into a racetrack earlier this year, narrowly avoiding tragedy. On April the 20th, a grey Porsche Carrera was stolen from Linver Road in Fulham. Two days later, a grey Sierra Cosworth was stolen from Godfrey Davis Limited in Harrow. On Tuesday the 28th of April, both cars went to the Texaco service station in Scrubs Lane, West London. The drivers filled them up with petrol and left without paying. The cars were next seen outside Curry's in Marlborough, Wiltshire, where they were used in a burglary. Thousands of pounds worth of electrical goods were stolen. The gang then drove to Bristol, travelling at speeds of up to 150 miles per hour. The police followed them until the pursuit ended when the Sierra went the wrong way up the M32. The cars were later found abandoned in Bristol. The Sierra here in Staple Hill and the Porsche in Stanley Avenue. Did you see either car between the 20th and the 28th of April? Or better still, do you recognise this man? He's in his late 20s, 5 foot 7 and slim. Ring us if you think you know him. 
do you recognise these two men? They're part of a gang who forced their way into a house in Blackpool on Friday evening, the 24th of July, threatening a mother and her three children with a gun. The intruders stole a large amount of cash and jewellery before escaping in a light green metallic Ford, similar to this one. It had false number plates, UHG 840Y. The first man's about 29, 5 foot 8 with a stocky build. He had short black hair and wore a black baseball cap, a blue denim jacket and a dark t-shirt. The second man was older, about 35, also 5 foot 8 with short fair hair and a pale complexion. He was wearing a light blue shirt and curiously his left hand was completely covered with a cream bandage. If you know who they are, please ring. Thousands of cars drive past here every day. It's the junction of Gravel Hill and Regent's Park Road, North London. If you were here on the afternoon of Thursday the 27th of August, you may have information which could help us investigate a violent sexual assault. It was about 3.45 when a woman driving a Honda Accord stopped at these traffic lights. A man in the car and threatening her with a knife made her drive about six miles to a disused industrial estate. From here, she doesn't know where exactly she was taken, but remembers driving up an unmade road or track to a secluded place. There was a one or two story workshop, garage or warehouse, which had a gable roof with possibly a round window or sign at the front, and it was within easy earshot of a busy main road. Do you know where it could be? She was so shocked and confused she couldn't remember driving home, but sometime that afternoon her car was badly damaged. Did you see what happened? The man who assaulted her is 30 to 40, 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 11, stocky but not overweight. He was generally scruffy and wore jeans, a t-shirt and a pair of sunglasses. If you can help with this or any of our other cases, please do call. There's the number, 081 811 811, 081 811 8181. Now, James Kenneth Cunningham, if you're watching this program, frankly, you'd do well to go to a police station and uh, off yourself because uh, you're wanted in connection with a serious offence in uh, New Zealand. There's been so many calls. I think a third of a very strong response tonight has been on that photo call inquiry on James Kenneth Cunningham. And a number of police officers, two of them very senior, have rung in on that. Strong calls, too, on the rest of the photo call cases and particularly on the Helen Gorry murder. We'll give you more of that in just a moment. And our next case is an armed robbery on a security van in Staffordshire. For obvious reasons, it's important to avoid publicising security details and routines, and you'll notice our reconstruction is deliberately vague at times. The film actually begins five months before the robbery took place at a car auction at Meesham in Leicestershire. The Protec Security Company had ceased trading in 1991, and this was the last of its vans to go under the hammer. Bob Sutton, a second-hand car dealer, was keen to buy it. He'd bought three previously, which had sold well. This time, however, he had a rival bidder. At £1,400, £1,500. £1,500, £1,600 £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £1, £
At 10 o'clock that morning, Group 4's security van drew up at the back of a parade of shops. I heard a screech of either tyres or a fan belt, which quite concerned me, and uh, went to the back of the door to see if my car was all right. And as I got to the back of the door, the Group 4 van was just driving off. The guards were ordered to drive towards the neighbouring village of Pattingham, avoiding the main roads and sticking to remote country lanes. Two miles on, on the outskirts of Pattingham, the guard missed a turning he'd been instructed to take, nearly driving into the yard of a meat wholesaler's. When I saw the group poor van coming down the lane, I thought that there was roadworks down Jenny Walker's lane and that the van was doing a detour to try to get back onto the main road. But when I see the van reverse, I presumed it must be making its way down the Ford, which was most unusual for a van of that size to try and attempt to get down there, because it's quite a rough road. Although the witness didn't see the Protec van, police feel sure it had gone ahead through the Ford. Beyond the Ford is an empty field. You know what we're saying? You won't get hurt. The security van was robbed and the guards abandoned. The Protec van continued along the narrow lanes for another two miles, passing through the villages of Trescott and then Dimmingsdale. And somewhere along that route, another vehicle would have joined them. Then, at the little hamlet of Lower Penn, the usual peace and tranquillity was suddenly disturbed. It sounded like a van to myself. It stopped sharply, and the rate of activity that was going on, I knew there was something wrong. At this, I went to have a look to see what was going on. The vehicle was high performance, it shot away. It must have been four door, because the three doors slammed. It was low, because we couldn't see it. By the time I got to the end of the drive, the vehicle had gone out of sight. The Protec van had been abandoned under the old railway bridge. Well, Derek Baker, we didn't see what actually happened with the robbery there, but we can say it was no picnic, can't we? We can indeed. The people who carried out this attack were both effective and ruthless. And it's fair to say that the three security guards had a pretty tottering time for half an hour or so, and they were in genuine fear of their lives. Obviously, because of that, we wished to capture these people, but also we believe they're connected with five other similar jobs in the Midlands region over the last 10 years, and they've made an awful amount of money out of it. So it is very important to catch yes, these men? Yes, yes, it is indeed. Now you do have two artists' impressions. Yes, we do. The first one is of the man we saw in the film at the Meesham car auctions on March the 3rd. And it's quite a good likeness, we think. Yeah, we, we describe him as about six foot. He's a broadly built chap, and he's got short, mousy hair. And the second man was yes. seen uh, changing a tyre on the van in the Nottingham area. Yeah, this is an interesting uh, uh, sighting of this chap. We've got a witness who said he was flagged down by a man with a van and helped him to change uh, a tyre. Uh, in the van with the, with the man was a woman with long blonde hair. We would describe the man in probably his early 30s, stocky build, quite smartly turned out. And it's quite interesting sighting this one. It's at a place called Bramcott, two or three miles outside Nottingham on the way to Derby. So somebody might be able to corrobor yes, corroborate seeing yes, the man around there. So. There's no direct link, of course, with either of those two men and the actual robbery no, itself. The Protec van uh, was around for five months between March and August. How much do you know about what happened to it during that time? Well, there are, there are quite a lot of interesting things about the van, two in particular. Um, when it was sold, almost all the markings and livery were still on it, except on the driver's side, the P and the R of the Protec were missing and the 558, which was part of the telephone number, that was also missing. They've been replaced by the offenders. Uh, they've, they've been cut out professionally, uh, measured professionally, cut out professionally. We'd obviously like to know anyone who can remember carrying out some obscure order. The other thing about the van is that within two weeks of buying it at Meesham, they went to the trouble of re-registering it with Swansea. They again used the name Protec, but they gave an address at 99 Princess Road, Mossside, Manchester and they taxed the vehicle. We feel this would have got through an ordinary police check thereafter. Uh, but obviously we're very keen to know what part this address in Mossside, Manchester, the 99 Princess Road, plays in this matter. So it may have been in Manchester as well? Hartshorn, yes. Nottingham, Manchester? Oh yes, yes, a lot of connection. 
What about the description of the robbers themselves? They're obviously very vague indeed. Yes, they are, because uh, as we saw in the film, two of them have got um, helmets on, and the third one has got a ski mask. I would say that they were probably all in the late 30s. Um, the, the first two attackers, one was white, just under six foot. The second one was Afro-Caribbean, just over six foot. And the chap in the Prozac van was probably slightly, uh, slightly with our, below that height. And he appeared to be ginger and possibly freckled. And they may or may not, of course, turn out to be the men in the artist's impressions. No. Well, if you can help Mr Baker and his colleagues, and incidentally, there is a sizeable reward on offer for information leading to conviction, £25,000. The number to ring in the studio here is 081 811 or you can ring the Incident Room in Stafford direct, and that number is 0785 223654. That's 0785, the code for Stafford, 223654. Milton Keynes, the new town, prides itself as an escape from inner city pressures and people there enjoy a relatively low crime rate. But for a year now, there's been one of the most frightening forms of crime, a series of assaults on women walking alone on footpaths. Rather than have people trapped by fear of going out alone, the community needs to have this man caught and caught quickly. In the film that follows, all the victims you see and hear are portrayed by actors. The attacks seem to be random, many on Thursday evenings between 5 and 10 o'clock. This time, last November, was when a travelling fair was in the area. a very good description of this man especially his hair which you say is long at the front and pushed back is there anything else you can remember about him at all did he say anything to you I think I think he said that his wife and children were killed in a car crash okay, okay so right. hello joy Here's the statement from the rape that happened last night. Oh, thanks a lot. Did we have a medical examination last night? Yeah, everything's gone off to the lab. Yeah, we got some samples for DNA then, have we? Uh-huh. This looks like a pretty good description here. Do you think we'll be able to get an artist's impression from her? Yeah, I'm sure she'll do one. This had been the third attack in a month. All had taken place around here, near the Old Barn pub by Fishermead. And all were on redways footpaths and cycle paths that crisscross Milton Keynes. They're the only way to get about on foot. Three weeks after that, another woman was attacked. Well, I was coming home from work and it was about 20 past five and my route home takes me past the barn, which is a pub, and then I go over the bridge and into the Fishermead estate. And I'm never normally worried about walking around, especially at that time, because there's always lots of people around the pub and it's also very well lit. Excuse me? Yeah. Can you tell me like a coffee hall? Coffee hall? Um, I think you want to be heading in sort of that sort of direction. What are you doing? Get off me! Get off me! Ow! Well, he looked about 28. And he was quite stockily built. And his hair was brown. And it was short over his ears. And it was a bit longer on top. And it could have been curly. Detectives brought in a colleague, a crime analyst, to see if a pattern could be found in the attacks. I was asked to look at the statements in detail and began to pick out the important aspects, and in particular the methods being used and the description of the offenders. We knew that the offences were occurring on a Thursday and in fact all four of the offences occurred in the same area of the redways. Other characteristics which were coming out in attacks three and four, the hairstyle was starting to sound familiar. Um, in attacks three and four again he was described as having rough hands um, and this, in fact, could have indicated that he was a manual worker. Or, in fact, in attack number two, he wore gloves, which could indicate that he was hiding some kind of skin complaint. Surveillance was set up on the redways, but with over 100 miles of paths to cover, it was impossible to look everywhere at once, and attacks continued unseen by the surveillance teams. Yeah, I'll ring you back 
at seven, okay? Okay, All fine, right, then. Bye. bye. See you. I left my friend's house that night at about ten to nine. It takes me about ten minutes to get home. It was a clear night and it's quite well lit on my route home. I wasn't very worried because I knew that I had to go past the barn pub and it's usually quite busy on a Thursday night anyway. As I started to cross the footbridge, I remember a cyclist passing by me, but I didn't take much notice of him at all. I saw the jogger passing by me. I thought he looked a bit odd because he was wearing jeans, but I wasn't very worried because I could see the pub just on the other side of the bridge. Sea tank pub 90, could you attend the Barn Public House, Central Milton Keynes, an allegation of rape? The aggrieved is with the managers uh, in the manager's office. Over. Nine zero will attend DTA two minutes over. Roger. Morning everyone. Yeah. Right, you'll be aware that last night we had another rape reported. That's very similar in method and location to the one that happened a couple of months ago. Uh, the samples have gone off to the laboratory, so what we need to do immediately is to do some house to house inquiries in the area immediately around where this last attack took place. You've got the description, and don't forget that this man last night probably had a bicycle. And bear in mind that this man is probably a loner. He lives locally, maybe with one or both parents, and he may be unemployed. I just ask you to bear these points in mind when you're doing these house-to-house -house inquiries. The DNA did match. And since the beginning of this year, the inquiry has been on a heroic scale. Over 3,000 people have been interviewed. Over 500 blood samples have been taken. But this man is still free. He's about five foot nine, late twenties, has brown hair, short around the ears, has rough hands, and probably lives locally, maybe with his mum or dad. And look too at this impression, which has been compiled by another victim. Police believe they're the same man. Do you recognise him? Detective Superintendent John Bound is here. He's uh, looking after the inquiry. He's brought some of his, his team up. And you can call them here at the studio on 081 811 8181. Or you can call their colleagues at the incident room at Milton Keynes. There's the number 0908 686 441 or 4. That's 0908 686 441 or 4. Now, have you seen any fabrics like these in the last two weeks? They're uh, all part of a pretty distinctive and big consignment which has been stolen. They're Indian rugs, tablecloths, cushions, quilts and bedspreads, all made of wool and hand loom cotton. This bedspread here, for example, has been hand blocked in India using up to 60 different carved blocks. There's a lot of work in these bedspreads. Uh, the pewter finished candlesticks there, they've been stolen too, or some like them. These rugs are all hand-woven in little villages in the, north, in the north of India. You can see there's quite a variety of patterns and uh, the labels are all marked fabrication there. That's assuming the labels are still there because they're only just stuck on, so they may well have disappeared by now. If you're a dealer, has a rep offered you this kind of stuff in bulk? The consignment was stolen a fortnight ago, so we're only interested in any of these fabrics which have been offered for sale in the last two weeks. And in particular, does this resemble anyone you know? This is an artist's impression of a man who has been trying to sell a haul of stolen fabrics in East London. If you know who he might be, or if you recognise any of these items, then the number to call 081-811-8181. Here it is again, 081-811-8181. A very strong response on the call so far on the Helen Gorry murder in particular, over 40 calls which have been described as uh, very, very helpful indeed. On the Michael Towler one as well, a great number of calls and several people think they might be able to identify the Toshiba video which we've been looking for. On uh, photo call, well, we've just almost been besieged by that in a one case in particular with, uh, I think, 30 sightings of one man in the south of London and in the Surrey area. A great deal more on instant uh, room, instant desk as well. The lines uh, here are open until just after midnight and we'll have more news just before then, after question time, just before midnight. That's a Crime Watch update, just before midnight. I'm sorry it's going to be so late. If you can't stay up till then, well, do keep what we've shown tonight in proportion. We've uh, just shown more serious crime than some police officers will encounter in a lifetime. So, unless you've been responsible for some of them, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>